Welcome to Beyond the Press Release on production of Gorecom, in which we take the time to speak with small cap executives after they put out big news. And big news is what he put out today, record setting across the board. Paul Gezi, CEO of Control Technologies, trades in Canada under the stock symbol KNR. And for our friends in the US, under the stock symbol KNRLF. And even for our friends in Europe on Frankfurt under 1K8. For those who are new to the story, because you saw the headline and it was a huge headline. Here's what you need to know. If Google Nest is the leader in smart home technology, control technology is the small as a small cap leader in smart building technology. They're leading the digital transformation of buildings and the built environment by delivering enhanced intelligence through IoT technology and solutions that create smart, healthy, sustainable buildings. The customers that they have, they're also interested in their ability to reduce energy consumption, lowering greenhouse gas emissions, and creating safe and healthy spaces for their employees, customers, stakeholders, considering what's going on with COVID and safe buildings. More than just lip service, because a lot of companies like to talk the talk, control is walk the walk, listen to these numbers. Record revenue, 21.5 million in the third quarter, just announced up 614%. Record adjusted EBITDA, 2.8 million, up 224%. Record net income of 2.1 million, on and on, powerful balance sheet, cash flows way up, they hit it out of the park, and they're raising their fiscal 21 uh, outlook, revenue now between 43 and 46 million, up from 38 million, and that takes EBITDA with it. Paul, so much going on, welcome back, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, great to be back, great to be back. Hey, it's gotta be great for you to be back because something you told me a while ago is you said, George, you know what? For a while, we're gonna go into a bit of a quiet mode, because we just yeah. want to deliver and show the market. I know what we've got. I want to deliver it and then come out talking. Before we could dive into the numbers a little bit, how good does it feel to <laughs> announce this record quarter, literally across every metric you've got? Yeah, so look, it, it's great. It's a team effort. Um, of course. And, you know, the way we think about it is um, the hardest thing to do is, is to grow and be profitable. It's the hardest thing to do, right? So it's very easy to grow and lose money. Um, and it's really, it's, you know, that's kind of like small caps, right? You, you, you knock revenue out of the park, but you're losing money. The hardest thing and the biggest challenge is because you've got to, you got to watch your costs, got to watch your balance sheet. So it's not just the revenue that we're really proud of. It's the discipline that we put into the business on the net income side. Right. And, um, I think we delivered four cents per share of net income in the quarter, which is huge. And, um, you know, the other hard thing is, you know, where your business is going because you're working on it every day but you don't talk about it every day. So you have to wait for the queue to print, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a great time because this is you know, six months of, of hard work that has gone into this moment. And this is just, you know, it's another milestone. It's the beginning of something else. And we really want to grow you know, this business because we believe in it, we're passionate about it and the wind's at our back. And, and as insiders, as management, you guys own a, good, a better percentage of this company than most insiders do, right? Which means you are right there, right there with shareholders and making sure this company grows and performs well. I think, I think if you look at our history, go back to 2016, you know, look at all the filings and, and we're still the largest shareholder in the business. It is pretty rare. I will say this. I've been around small cap, so I know the market. It's pretty rare to see an executive team after six or seven years, you know, still is the largest position in the business. I know there's a few companies that do that. You know, kind of in small caps, most executives around that five to six year mark, they start exiting. There's, there's a turnover. But we think that we're really at the beginning of the next round of growth. And we started this at a million of revenue in 2016. Unbelievable. We're going to end in the 40s this year. I mean, that's a pretty good kegger year over year. Um, and, you know, if you keep doing that, you keep growing, you're going to get rewarded. I don't know, you know, exactly. I don't, I don't worry about the day-to-day. -day. That's, that's what most of the questions I get is the day-to-day -day share price. What you worry about is if you're growing the business day-to-day, -day, you're going to get rewarded, right? And so as long-term shareholders, what we feel is we're just at the beginning of the next level of growth uh, in our future. Well, look, I, I'll say this, in the 24 and three quarters years that, that I've been doing this, uh, the, the stock market sometimes misprices or undervalues even the biggest companies. Remember Warren Buffett built an entire empire on buying great companies that were just not understood or mispriced by the market. But what I've known is that eventually sooner or later, 
you get it back in spades it mm-hmm. comes to you and you know in addition to having this fantastic quarter what's really unbelievable is that you guys think you're going to also double your market share in 2022 so you've raised you've raised your guidance for 2021 and you're, you're do you guys really think you're going to you're double your market share in 2022 from 400 yeah, buildings so to we, 800 buildings one of the metrics we use which is really important is uh we think of a building as a customer and so you know there, there's a there's kind of a ramp up in that where you start with 20 30 40 50 you start to get scale and, and so we're at this important number of around 400 buildings and, and what that means is we're in large portfolios now and so when you're in a large portfolio and you're executing uh, we've already put an outlook out um, in the past that revenue would be around 80 to 90 million which is almost a double from this year so really what that represents is doubling the footprint of the customer profile building that we're in. And really what's driving that is the technology platform. So as we scale our technology with our customers, we're scaling into more buildings. Um, So it's exciting for us because it's really the first time in about, I would say eight years where you have a pure wind at the back. What's driving that is um, corporate sustainability. Every major corporation has a sustainability program where they're trying to reduce emissions and be a better corporate citizen. You now have government policy where, you know, forget the lofty COP26, you know, X amount of emissions. What, what, what's really happening is building owners are going to be taxed if they don't have lower emissions. So that's a real economic incentive right now that didn't exist three years ago. And then basically energy is off the charts. I don't know if you know this, but building, it, building owners are paying about 40% more in natural gas costs this year. And so well, the entire get- energy complex... Exactly. Is, we right. hear about oil to gas pump, but with right. that comes the entire energy complex. It's the every building is up about 40% in energy spend. It's really amazing. When you think of the energy market as a bunch of buildings that are going to consume half the world's energy in the next 10 years, they've got to address the problem. So those are the three things we see really with the wind at our back and what's driving growth. Hey, um, devil's advocate, but more just insight also. This is a very competitive space. Um, what is it about you guys that you're able to not only maintain your market share, but really grow it? What's, what's happened that you're able to compete with the Siemens and other guys, the world, the, the big boys of the world and win more and more deals. Cause, uh, that- yeah, great question. Great question. So there's really two markets. There's the large cap multinational market. So Honeywell, Johnson control, Siemens, Schneider, et cetera. Then there's really how the business operates. It's a regional private market. So most of our competitors are regional private companies that don't have the full suite of technology and solutions that we have vertically integrated. Rarely do we compete with a large, you know, integrated multinational because they're not coming down to our market. And that's how we can win market share. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, sure. uh, all right. So is that and and regional is a massive market, no matter what, right? I mean, the, that's that. So you see, you see a lot of runway in 2022, 2023 in front of you to, to keep getting those wins. Cause I'd imagine now your name is really getting out there. Cause one thing I know about small business, once you start to accelerate people who are sitting on the fence, George Com properties suddenly says, Hey, let's call the guys at control. They look like they're doing some good stuff. So is that, is that, is that the momentum, the acceleration? Yeah. What's seeing? really interesting is when you win and we announced a couple pretty significant portfolio wins. You know, when you win a customer, the industry is very competitive. Other real estate owners and asset managers and property managers want to know what, why did that group select you to lead that smart technology platform? So it really creates a snowball effect in the industry where one large REIT selects you, the other ones are looking at you saying, why did they select you? So we've been experiencing that as well. And I guess when they come knocking, you've got a great answer for them. That makes them makes them think, all right, maybe, maybe we should be using you guys as well. Yeah, the, uh, you know. Go no, go ahead, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, so through an integrated technology platform that now includes services and asset management and project management and projects, where we've got it covered really vertically integrated. It's a one-stop solution driven by technology. And that, that also plays into this regional market of small companies that can't fulfill on all those uh, avenues or verticals. M&A has played an important part in your growth as well. Do you foresee <clears throat> M&A continuing to play an important role in, uh, in your growth strategy? And if so, is there a specific, is it, is it going to be driven by geography because you want more of a presence somewhere or is it going to be more driven by 
we we want to get this tech stack in. We want to add this <laughs> this tech stack onto our onto our existing solutions, or is it both? Yeah, so, so I'll say I'm not a fan of small cap rollups. And so what I mean by that is if, if you've created a small cap just to go acquire other companies, I'm not a fan. And the reason I'm not a fan, you tend to overpay. You, you tend to have to do a deal to stay in business. So you're raising money and you're doing deals. We've been much more strategic um, and laser focused on finding good value that is a strategic fit and not overpaying. So the reason we're netting composite is we don't overpay when we do an acquisition. We're typically in the four to five times EBITDA, maybe 0.4 to 0.6 times revenue. And if you're doing that and you're managing your costs, you're gonna make money, right? Because the market's gonna give you that arbitrage. You've got your costs under control, everything looks good. So we think about it as where can we add value and not overpay? And the next sector I'm looking at is, is a US software acquisition that fits our, our platform where we can use that software platform to scale our services and other verticals and I, I'm looking pretty hard at that right now and that would be very strategic and uh, you know the and the easiest thing to do in an M&A transaction is overpay that's the easiest thing to do <laughs> oh, yeah because it, it, it removes all the hard work and pain that's, that's say, right just give it to them I want to make the that's acquisition right. rip the bandit right. off and let's right. put it over right. right the hardest thing to do is underpay and so we try and find good value at a reasonable price with a strategic fit where we can cross all it's worked really well for us so we're averaging about 1.5 acquisitions per year and i think that's healthy we're you know we're not rushing it we've got a great year over year growth rate um and we've got a lot more we want to do there but i don't i never want people to think of us as you know a roll-up that's desperate to go do acquisitions that has to overpay because i really don't believe in that your bargaining position though no doubt gets stronger with every successful acquisition with every successful queue that you put out and correct me <clears> if i'm wrong so George Calm Controls is more likely as a private company to say, you know what, maybe I will get acquired by Paul and his team over there because they've got their act together. My life's work, I've been, I've, I found this company 15 years ago and you know, you're very careful about who you hand it over to and whose stock you take. So yeah. am I right in assuming that with every successful quarter and raising guidance, your bargaining position gets stronger because you can look at George and say, look, George, you're gonna be good hands. I'm not gonna yeah. overpay. So but let me let me put it this way: without, without naming names, um, you know, I, about eight nine months ago, I met with a group, and they said, "You're never going to scale. You know, you're never going to put up a great quarter. You're never going to make money because you're public." So here we are, you know, six x on the revenue, and I think the big win for us, and you know, what we celebrate internally is 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 not so much the revenue growth; it's the EBITDA and the net income, because you can look around all of Canada small cap, right? And I'm not gonna pick on anybody. You know, you, you find me how many net income positive small caps are out there, right? Then you start looking at some of these high flying large caps. I'm not gonna name any names there. A lot of large caps are blowing out the revenue numbers, but their bottom lines are horrible, right? So I think what we're saying is we've got financial discipline in the business. Now we, now I used to say it, now we've scaled it to a new level and we can demonstrate it. And this is the beginning of the next stage, but we're very proud of the financial discipline we put in here, which again is, is really where the hard work is, is, uh, is not blowing through your P&L and just constantly raising money. And so, you know, that, that's what we're really most proud of right now. That financial discipline sometimes works against you where it makes you a target yeah. of, yeah. you know, I'll use George Com again, because that way I'm not naming any names, right. but George Com now takes note, takes notice that, hey, we can acquire control. But that's another good reason that you guys have such high inside uh, ownership as a management team, because you're you're much more likely to stave off a uh, opportunistic uh, opportunistic takeover, right? But no doubt you've got to be on the radar now. Yeah, so I would say there's kind of two things. One is um, when you're not always raising, you know, capital because you're buying something. Um, you know, the, the investment banking market or the capital markets, you know, it, it, it's not really a great fit in the short term. So, uh, you know, we kind of view ourselves as much more strategic in our approach to capital and our approach to acquisitions and our approach to growth. On the, um, on the other side of it, uh, when you're not getting as much valuation, you know, at a point in time, you, you can be a potential kind of takeover candidate, but having a high insider position, you know, supports the fact that we still want to grow the business and we're really just getting started in our view we you know what this quarter represents to us is really the next stage of everything that we're going to do 
and um, it's taken us from 2016 to get to here in a very disciplined way. And now what, what are we going to do next? Right. And that's really what our focus is. Yeah. And now you've got everyone on the, on the investor side saying, okay, Paul and his team have our attention. So now we really got to watch and see what these guys are going to do next as they've done it well all along. We can't have this kind of a discussion without also talking about, look, it used to be when you and I first met, it was before COVID hit. So back then the discussion yep. was reducing energy consumption, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But now what's been added onto the mission statement, I'm going to read it again, is creating safe and healthy spaces for employees, customers, and stakeholders. That's because of COVID and right. monitoring air inside of buildings. So how is BioCloud going? What can we talk about there in terms of uh, BioCloud? Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we're very proud of BioCloud. It's been super creative on a number of levels. First and foremost, it's put us into the global sphere where, you know, we have global HVAC companies contacting us, right? So, of course, there's going to be more news on that because we, we said there's going to be no, more news. But it, it's pretty rare for a multi-billion dollar company to reach out to a small cap and say, hey, let's look at your technology and maybe do something together, right? I, I, don't, think, I don't think most retail investors understand that, how difficult that is to go from small cap to X billion, right? So we're on the global stage. Uh, it's been super creative. I think what happened with BioCloud is we were pre-vaccine. So when we were doing our initial kind of run uh, in terms of uh, analysis, prototyping, getting ready, the vaccines kind of put a cloud and, and more from a market, you know, public market narrative that the vaccines are here. Anything that's not vaccine related is a waste of time. I think the complete opposite is true. What we're finding now is, you know, high vaccine rates are not putting an end to this, right? So it's a combination of vaccine technology rapid testing. And for the first time, I don't know if you noticed this, but for the first time, there's this new language around aerosolized spread. And it happened, it started happening about two or three weeks ago. And, and, you know, most governments were really slow to say the virus spreads and it's aerosolized. So I think BioCloud is coming into its own as an HVAC and safe space technology. And, you know, I think we're very, we're very happy with the progress that we're making, the partners that we're accumulating. And if you look at the overall business, it's it's part of an amazing business that we're growing. And I think for about four months there, we became Control BioCloud and everything else didn't exist, <laughs> which for me was very strange because I'm working on the entire business, which is energy emissions and air quality, right? And uh, and so I think it's one of those things that happens in small caps where the narrative takes over you know, the company. I think it's in the right place now. It's a creative technology, super exciting. It's bringing huge partnerships to the table. It's a creative to revenue and earnings. And, and we're excited about the future. And if I think about the future as being the next 10 years, you know, I was having a discussion today with, um, you know, a $20 billion HVAC company. Um, and the guy said to me, you know, one of the executives, you know, every building is going to have some form of viral and pathogen detection system in it, whether it's BioCloud or something else. And that to me was complete affirmation that like, you know, I'm in the right space with this technology. Um, these things don't roll out overnight. They take time because you're kind of changing the way you view an old system. But we can connect with any HVAC system or we can connect separately from the HVAC system. And I think, you know, BioCloud is going to shine, um, but we are control technologies building a diversified business and we're in compositive. So I'm, I'm really excited about the future. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And BioCloud is just a real great potential additional stream. And in fairness to you, by the way, there are a lot of businesses that had that vaccine pause Right, uh, right. Because a lot of potential customers or customers said, hold on here, maybe the vaccine is the panacea <laughs> and therefore we don't have to spend any more money on anything and this yeah. just goes away. And right. now we know that that's, that's not the case. So ho um, hopefully investors recognize, because this is really important, um, you know, the energy and the emission side have gone up and that is related to, it's directly related to the economy opening up, you know, with, with vaccines. So on one part of our business, has gone up, you know, dramatically. On the other part, we have this amazing innovation that is for the economy to reopen, you know, and, and be part of the future. It's also part of our present today. But that's an example of being extremely well diversified, having multiple verticals, yeah. driving, driving revenue and driving the bottom line. And I think what we've shown is, you know, we can innovate 
we can create new technology, we can grow the business, and we can be profitable. And I think if you put all that together, I would say we're pretty unique in small cap Canada. Um, and, you know, hopefully investors feel that way too. Yeah, we know, look, we know a lot of small caps that rocketed and, dying and died based on right. just one product and all of it. And here you are with the underlying business securing everything, which gives BioCloud the time and space it needs to find it to find its market. So last question just on BioCloud. How does is is there a pipeline that's evolving there? How are you seeing the pipeline evolve for BioCloud? Or is it still early and you're still making those inroads? Yeah, sure. So we, we don't segment revenues, but what we can say is, is the partnerships that we've added uh, are very significant. And we're really just at the beginning stages. There's more partnerships that will be added, but we've got a, a, an HVAC company we're going to be announcing shortly. We had Steelcase. Um, you know, there's BioCloud units, which is really interesting. They're all, they're all over the world. Um, and if you asked me a year ago, do you think you're going to have a technology, you know, pre-BioCloud that there's going to be demand all over the world for it? I would say, nah, I, I think we're a North American, you know, kind of centric energy emission company. And so it really is where our energy technology is really North American centric. BioCloud is the global technology. And that's really exciting for us because, you know, it's in a lot of different places and, uh, you know, we'll get more feedback. So you saw we released some testing today, some yeah. study. That took time, right? You, you can't do that in a week. Um, and, and those things, because they take time, some people lose their patience. But in, when you're building a business, you don't worry about that stuff. When you mean some people, you mean some shareholders, but your yeah. target market doesn't lose right. the patients because they no. want and, you to and, do it right. And customers will wait with you, will work yeah, with you. Of course. Right. And so I would say it's the product that is global in our business where the, the other products are more North American centric. Well, Paul, uh, in the meantime, congratulations on an unbelievable press release. To you. And when I mean that, it's obvious to your whole team, but you're the tip of the spear, you're the CEO. And we know what kind of a team you've assembled over there. But man, rec again, record revenues for the Q, record adjusted EBITDA, record net income. And you guys have raised your guidance for the year upwards in between 43 and 46 million, up from 38. And adjusted EBITDA looks like seven, six to 7 million, up from 3.7. I mean, I just, we're going to, you can celebrate that all day long, <laughs> have a great time with it. And, uh, and, you know, make sure you make sure with, because we saw your tweet on the weekend, you guys were all working and I put out, we, a tweet we, we, you know, we, we put in the long hours. Uh, it's been long hours. We did put in long hours over the weekend. And, you know, when you think about it, I'm fighting for shareholders because I'm one of the largest shareholders. I, you know, I always think about alignment and, uh, we're working hard to build a real business and um, you know, we, uh, we want this to be much bigger than it is today. That's for sure. Yeah. And I tweeted that out. I actually saw that. I have to be sitting in my family room. I saw that from you and I real quote tweeted and I said, this is what happens when management owns such a significant share right. of the company. They're working on Saturdays for the shareholders. Everybody wins. So on behalf of everybody, on behalf of the 99%, because there's always someone who's not happy, but a happy on behalf of 99% Paul, congratulations. Thank you as a shareholder also. Thank you. And looking forward to more great stuff and have you back on my friend. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. For everybody at home, you've been watching or you've been listening by podcast on Spotify, Google, Apple, your favorite podcast platform to Paul Gezi, CEO of Control Technologies, trades in Canada under KNR in the US, KNRLF and in Europe under 1K8. For those new to the story, because like I said, you saw that massive headline and said, who are these guys? Here's how you do your due diligence. First, get to the company's profile page on Agoracom because there are so many, as you've heard or watched here, there's so many moving parts of this and we know you don't capture it all. On Agoracom, we've got it nice and neatly summarized, compartmentalized for you, that, that good thousand foot view. But then from there, make sure you do it, link over to the control website, do your deep dive due diligence because if you believe in the future guys of smart building smart technology the need to reduce energy consumption not just not just from a cost point of view but from uh, an environmental point of view along with greenhouse gas emissions then control has got to be on your radar do your due diligence we can't tell anything more than that but i can tell you don't say 12 months from now we didn't tell you so thanks for joining us have a great day see you next time Hey guys, this video is over, but don't forget to help your company by liking it and then leaving a comment below. 
And then don't forget to help yourself by subscribing to our channel so you don't ever miss another great Agoracom small cap video.